Welcome to the Literary Digest. Please subscribe to the channel or give a like and comment on this video if you find it helpful to help us reach more people. Anger is often seen as something to be quelled or hidden particularly among marginalized communities. Lama Rod Owens challenges that view, urging us to see this emotion as a potential catalyst for change and healing. As he sees it, anger is a crucial part of his identity as an African American, a gay man, and a committed activist. Love and Rage delves into how this potent emotion, when approached with awareness, love, and compassion, can change from a guardian of personal pain to a dynamic force for solidarity and social justice. It is addressed to everyone who feels their anger has been dismissed or demonized, often those who stand to benefit most from hearing their own voices and needs acknowledged. Owens advocates for a mature, informed relationship with anger that goes beyond mere expression to become a healing, liberating force. Chapter 1 Anger is an Invitation to Perceive Our Deepest Hurts What kind of thing is anger? A good place to start is to see how it's connected to tension. Anger is both a mental and physical tension that emerges when we are emotionally hurt and are trying to work out how to care for ourselves amid that pain. This tension can lead to a rigid aversion, typically manifesting as aggression, that distracts us from nurturing our well-being and shifts our focus towards self-protection, often escalating into violence. Anger, then, is more than a simple emotion, it's a complex response that surfaces from the struggle between acknowledging our hurt and figuring out how to heal. It becomes a cycle in which the energy of anger demands to be directed outwardly, often leading us to assign blame and seek eradication of perceived threats or causes of our discomfort. However, this outward expression rarely resolves the inner turmoil. The persistence of anger, even after confrontations, suggests that it serves as a protective layer over deeper vulnerabilities. Especially for those who feel marginalized or invalidated, anger can falsely present itself as a source of power or validation. This brings us to a crucial strategy, transforming the energy of anger into a force for self-care and healing. Rather than expressing anger through aggression or avoidance, it's about acknowledging and articulating the underlying hurt. By doing so, we shift the focus from the anger itself to the cause of our pain, initiating a process of true healing. This process involves moving away from destructive expressions of anger, such as physical confrontations or passive aggression. These are merely distractions from the real issues at hand. Instead, by genuinely touching upon our hurt, we allow it to inform and guide our healing. This approach doesn't mask the pain but instead invites it into a broader, more compassionate space within us. Mourning and grieving our losses and hurts enable us to experience a newfound spaciousness within ourselves, where hurt is no longer all-consuming but just one aspect of our larger, complex emotional landscape. And that's the key takeaway here, the path to managing anger constructively is not through suppression or explosion, but rather through empathetic engagement with our own vulnerabilities. It's about turning inward with kindness and courage, addressing the roots of our anger, and ultimately fostering an environment within ourselves where healing can flourish amid the vastness of our emotional experiences. This approach not only liberates us from the cycles of anger but also empowers us to live with a greater sense of peace and self-compassion. Chapter 2 We Have to Acknowledge Our Anger Before We Can Let It Go Navigating emotional landscapes, especially amid intense anger, presents a significant challenge, particularly for those sensitive to the emotional energies of others. Encountering anger, whether from others or within oneself, often leads to the absorption of toxic psychic energy. This energy, unmetabolized and unaddressed, perpetuates cycles of reactivity and harm, both internally and externally. Toxic psychic energy, characterized by its unprocessed nature, often results in emotional expressions that not only negatively affect the surrounding environment but that are also unrecognized by the individuals themselves. This dynamic creates a burden both for the person experiencing these emotions and for others around them, who may feel compelled to manage or absorb this energy, often to their detriment. 
Addressing and transforming these energies requires a nuanced approach to emotional processing and self-care, encapsulated in the SNOL strategy, a mindfulness-based method designed to help people navigate and transform difficult emotions effectively. This method includes several steps, seeing the emotion, naming it, owning it, experiencing it, letting it go, and letting it float, each playing a crucial role in managing emotional health and resilience. The process begins with the observation of emotions as they arise, identifying the physical sensations associated with them. By recognizing these sensations, be they tightness, heaviness, or discomfort, we can start to label these feelings accurately, moving away from vague attributions and toward a more precise understanding of their emotional state. Ownership of these emotions is crucial. It involves acknowledging and accepting that these feelings are present and are a response to genuine experiences or traumas. This acknowledgement is particularly vital in contexts of social oppression, where denial of agency over emotions can perpetuate cycles of disempowerment and trauma. By owning our feelings, we reclaim control over our emotional responses, paving the way for genuine self-expression. Experiencing emotions non-reactively allows us to observe our feelings without being overwhelmed by them. This approach fosters a deeper understanding of emotions, enabling us to respond to them in healthier, more informed ways. This experience can provide profound insights into the nature of emotional responses and their triggers. The practice of letting go involves a conscious decision to release emotional attachments that are not conducive to well-being. It is not about suppression or denial but about acknowledging and then moving past emotions that no longer serve a constructive purpose. Following this, letting emotions float entails a continued practice of detachment, maintaining a non-reactive stance even as emotions ebb and flow through consciousness. This comprehensive method fosters a resilience that allows us to navigate our emotional landscapes with greater autonomy and effectiveness. It offers a space for happiness and well-being that coexists with the full spectrum of human emotions, enabling us to engage with life's challenges from a place of strength and clarity. Chapter 3, Embracing Joy and Happiness Helps Heal Our Anger To become more attentive to anger is a form of mindfulness. And when you begin developing the spiritual muscle, you will quickly find that it can also be used in other contexts. Take feelings we often contrast with anger, happiness, and joy. Happiness is akin to the gradual warmth that fills a room when the heat is turned on subtle, slowly intensifying, and often only recognized in its contrast to prior discomfort. Joy, conversely, is like the immediate, intense warmth from a roaring fire in a fireplace, offering a quick and powerful burst of heat that fades unless sustained. Both states of mind are conducive to our well-being. Engaging with these emotions involves practical, everyday exercises that can transform our experiences. A simple yet profound practice is to actively notice moments of happiness or joy throughout the day. During these moments, you might cultivate a wish for others to experience similar joy or happiness, possibly dedicating this positive energy to someone specific. Such practices can extend even to moments of pleasure, like during sex, where the act of mentally offering this pleasure to others can transform the experience into one of wisdom and compassion, making it a less self-centered and more expansive encounter. Another powerful practice is to participate in the joy of others. This involves opening ourselves to others' happiness, empathizing with their joy, and experiencing it as if it were your own. This practice challenges us, especially when it involves happiness arising from circumstances we might envy or resent. Here, the practice becomes an antidote to jealousy, encouraging a shift toward a shared experience of joy that not only lessens personal grievances but also expands our capacity for happiness. This approach emphasizes that space for emotional processing already exists within us, it's a matter of turning our attention toward it rather than creating it anew. Acknowledging distractions and reactive patterns is crucial as these can cloud our awareness and reduce our ability to maintain emotional spaciousness. Techniques like mindful breathing can be instrumental in reconnecting us to this innate spaciousness, calming the mind and facilitating a more profound engagement with our internal states. 
Through these methods, we not only confront and manage emotions like anger more effectively but also enhance our overall mental and emotional landscape. By learning to navigate the complexities of happiness and joy, and by fostering a generous, empathetic engagement with the emotions of others, we can cultivate a more resilient self. Chapter 4. Self-Care is the Foundation Stone of True Compassion Navigating self-care in a world fraught with systemic violence and conflicting messages about self-indulgence is a profound challenge. True self-care transcends mere indulgence, which often isolates and prioritizes personal needs at the expense of others, and becomes a necessary strategy for survival and resistance. This approach aligns with the understanding that caring for oneself in oppressive systems is not an act of self-indulgence but a vital act of self-preservation and, indeed, a form of political warfare. Self-preservation as self-care involves practices that restore. One fundamental aspect of this is rest, distinct from mere sleep. Rest involves a deep letting go, a mental and emotional release that allows individuals to truly rejuvenate. This form of rest is not about duration but quality, deriving from practices that encourage a complete release of daily burdens and stresses. Compassion forms another cornerstone of authentic self-care, beginning with a compassionate attitude toward oneself. Recognizing our discomfort and actively wishing for relief sets the foundation for extending similar sentiments toward others. This expansion of compassion fosters a tender-heartedness that keeps us open, resilient, and less prone to emotional shutdown. In this state, we can better manage personal pain and the emotional weight of others, maintaining an open and receptive heart. Silence is also vital. It's not just the absence of speech but a space for deep listening and reflection. In silence, we can better attend to the inner workings of the mind and heart, translating chaotic or painful internal experiences into wisdom. This wisdom, once processed, can then be shared, contributing to both personal growth and communal well-being. Self-care in this context is about creating and maintaining a space within ourselves that allows for continuous engagement with personal and collective struggles. It's about forming a resilient self that can confront and challenge the forces that seek to diminish personal and collective agency. Through practices like rest, compassion, and silence, individuals not only preserve themselves but also empower themselves to engage in broader acts of social justice and community support. This approach to self-care thus becomes a transformative process that not only benefits the individual but also strengthens the ties to the communities of which they are a part, turning personal healing into a powerful act of collective resistance. Chapter 5. We can only overcome our anger when we learn to love it. Embracing anger through a lens of love is a transformative practice aimed at liberation not from the existence of anger itself, but from its overwhelming grip. This perspective allows us to hold anger without judgment or shame, acknowledging it as a part of ourselves that deserves recognition and space. This approach doesn't glorify anger for its destructive capacities but honors it as a signal of personal imbalance and deeper emotional truths. Loving anger means allowing both love and anger to coexist, transforming their dynamic into a duet in which love for oneself and for the happiness of others manages the space anger occupies. This approach fosters a deeper engagement with underlying issues of heartbreak and discomfort, which are often masked by the immediate reactions anger can provoke. However, embracing anger in this way is not without its risks. It exposes the raw, often painful truths about personal and external realities that we might prefer to ignore. Loving anger involves a radical honesty that can repeatedly break the heart as it forces confrontations with deeply held fears and injustices. Yet, this vulnerability is crucial to genuine self-love and to establishing a liberatory relationship with anger that demands unreserved acceptance. Operating from a place of love while allowing anger to inform our actions provides a pathway to connect personal hurt with the collective experience of others. Recognizing the shared nature of struggle and heartbreak fosters a sense of universal connection, emphasizing that personal pain is not unique but part of a broader human experience. Anger, then, contains valuable data that can guide one toward freedom, a richer life, and reduced harm both individually and collectively. 
It prompts the setting of boundaries and the expression of self-agency. To truly benefit from anger, one must love it and let it reveal the deeper locations of hurt and the lessons it contains. The transformative space that loving anger creates is one where anger becomes a teacher, revealing how to engage with pain in ways that foster growth and change. Avoiding this space means missing out on critical lessons that could prevent recurring cycles of trauma. Engaging with this discomfort is essential, as it is within these moments of tension and upheaval that the most significant opportunities for learning and caring for oneself arise. Loving our own anger, therefore, is not merely a practice of emotional management but also a profound commitment to personal transformation and healing. Final Summary in this summary to Love and Rage by Lama Rod Owens, you've learned that navigating anger involves understanding it as a complex response to emotional hurt and using it constructively for self-care and healing. Effective emotional management includes transforming anger into an insightful tool rather than expressing it destructively. True self-care, distinct from self-indulgence, acts as a form of resistance, involving practices like rest, compassion, and silence to maintain resilience. Embracing anger through love allows us to address deeper vulnerabilities, fostering personal growth and community ties while reducing violence and enhancing overall well-being. Thanks for listening. If you enjoyed this, please like and subscribe to the Literary Digest for more videos like this one. And don't forget to leave a comment below and let us know what you found most helpful. Until next time, keep striving for success.